they've shown through studies that if you show anybody anything in writing, it is 73% more convincing psychologically than if you just tell them verbally. And whenever I share that statistic with an audience, that anything in writing is 73% more convincing psychologically, I write it on the board to prove my point. <laughs> <laughs> this is why it's so important to use it. Not to mention it's a nice cue card. Because even a 20 year veteran can draw a blank. So if you're sitting there and you've got a nice rapport and you're trying to go through your services, all you have to do is have the wherewithal that is you click the mouse and each title pops up like a little cue card. You have to just have the wherewithal to remember how to paint a little verbal benefit picture of each service. So let's, Doug? I was just gonna say, um, Printed versus digital. You error, error, you're coming to that. No, but it's an interesting distinction. What do you think? It's a very good question. Would you have just the printed copy, and you could even have a laminated copy that you could leave with them for their perusal, or on the, the screen? What do you think? Uh, are there exceptions? Do you yeah. adapt depending on the situation? Yeah. Yes. I think if if you've got a good tablet or a good computer, you can get away with digital. But if you come in with like an old computer and that it'll it'll paint a bad picture for you, and you'll need to do printed. Like that's how I would perceive it. I think that's a very that's a good point. Anybody else? Yeah. I think leave them with something so they don't listen. But you can leave something. Uh, it would be a hard copy, but right through the fabric of the presentation, Doug brings up a very interesting point. Now, do you think it might depend on the demographic of who's in front of you? Mm -hmm. Possibly. Absolutely. Also, does it depend on what demographic you are? Do you know what the average age is of a realtor in North America? Yeah, so it changes. It varies by about a year every year. It's either 54 or 56. So, do you, now somebody sitting here could be 26, somebody else is in their 60s or 50s, whatever, but do you, irrespective of your own age, want to appear to be on equal footing <coughs> for the bells and whistles of all the competitors in your market region? So, we tend to lean towards showing up with it being on a tablet or on a laptop, a good one and be able to appear uh, effective at going through this. Because if they've just talked to some 29-year-old uh, Sharpie where it's really appearing proficient, and you walk in with some tattered leather-bound binder and prop it up, and then you, you say, here it is, and it's a paper copy, it may work against you. I like to think that you should appear to at least ostensibly be on equal footing of using the bells and whistles. Do you know from your experience what is used more? Well, what's used more in the last uh, handful of years would tend to be electronic. Okay. If I had to pick one or the other, it very much leans in that direction. Are there exceptions? Yes. Uh, do I know some, to this day some top agents that just bring out and use a paper type of representation? Yes. But maybe they were able to prevail in spite of the deficiency of the mechanics of what they were using. See, imagine if you told an amazing story. It wouldn't really matter maybe what you're showing. It didn't help matters, but it didn't weigh it down enough that you lost the opportunity because you're so impactful with what your, uh, your behavior. It is really a whole package. See, for example, not just the technology, but part of this, which to expand on your question, I don't think I covered this last time, but when they meet you for that first few minutes, the first few minutes of interaction, before you even uh, bring out a paper or a laptop, <coughs> They're going to judge you on all their life experience uh, of interacting with you, the so-called first impression of image, your aesthetic appearance, the tone of your voice, and the words that come into your mouth. Whether you're at an open house for the public and people walk in, or whether you're knocking at the door at seven o'clock and meeting them for the first time, within those first few critical minutes, they're all gonna judge you by the behavior of your aesthetic appearance, image, tone of voice, timbre of voice, and the words that come out of your mouth, adding up to 100% for impact, hopefully it's a good impact. Any psych majors here? How much would you allocate to image? The actual aesthetic appearance. Yes? I think it's 80%. 80%, so it doesn't leave much for tone, does it? Anybody else? I'd say at least about 50. For image? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but your first impression is an image of a person. If you don't look like a professional, then instantly I don't think you're a professional. Yep. Unless I hear your voice and what you say. It is a package. Uh, so in the, that's why I said in the first couple of minutes, I don't mean instantly because the instant, you can only judge by the aesthetic appearance. But in the first, say, usually within about nine or ten seconds of chatting with somebody, you make a determination subjectively what you think. As they start talking and behaving, you bring all your life experience to bear to just sniff over the situation and get just a gut instinct. Uh, that's why the first impression is so important. Anyways, for image, 55%, 38 for the tone, the words only count for seven. 
gap. Right there, I lose half the room psychologically where you're saying, you know, wait a minute, if Mike says that the words only count for seven, today after class when we get handed the text for listing presentation with all the wording, why bother memorizing the wording if it's only 7%? No, please rethink that position because like any chef would tell you, if you're cooking a recipe for a meal and you're off by 7% of one of the ingredients of the recipe, the meal's gonna taste pretty lousy. Each of these parts is of critical importance. The top agents in North America have pre-memorized all the effective language skill of how to counter any objection they get, stonewalling their efforts. And once they've memorized this so they're comfortable with the couching their words with the verbiage, it frees them up to focus on putting their best foot forward for the whole physicality, looking self-assured and confident. Okay. You're all masters of knowing how to overcome every objection you have there in the trenches. Just as a quick no. aside, yeah, if you're going to use the digital, and I'm obviously some of the younger people might, you're going to have to be really good with it, though, like not fumbling over it, I'm assuming. That's true, Doug. You're operating it properly, and it's... Yeah, you have to at least appear to be proficient with the bells and whistles. Here's my best recommendation as a consultant. For you at Century 21 Infinity, I would, if I were in your shoes, I would get that simple template made up by one of your graphic artists, where the only parts that are left blank would be <laughs> marketing plan for whatever that address is, the name of the record to be slotted in, and then this space blank for the picture. So have it ready at the front desk where on a whim, one of them can come by and say, okay, here's the address, here's the digital shot, and in a half hour turnaround time, they slap the color picture there, uh, the address marketing plan for that specific property and the name of the rep and then print it off with the actual picture of the property so they can run back out the door again and then uh, then maybe even hold in-house classes with your tech expert who could uh, just spend a few hours just uh, grammar you know hammer drill rehearse through it until each of you is proficient with turning on the machine and just a simple little powerpoint presentation it's not, I don't think it would be very difficult for most people to get uh, comfortable with that. No, and you can get like a very cheap iPad, which the thing I like about those is they're very simple yeah. in the way you operate them and everything. Like it's all $440 intuitive. $440 now or something, you're playing an yeah. iPad? Yeah, yeah, you can get one, I think, even pretty, yeah. Yeah, around that I, price. I priced one the other day. I mean, it's amazing, the technology for $440. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever find that the technology takes away from the personal contact? I've tried the online <clears> stuff, and I found that I didn't connect to people as much because they were so involved in trying to look at what I was doing than paying attention to my image and my tone, right? Now, I'm willing to adapt. If you're telling me September 2018 that you are working in this microcosm of a community environment where for whatever conditioning and reason, most people would prefer to see it on paper, well then let's adapt accordingly. Does your gut tell you that probably paper is the, is the better way to prevail or is it 50-50? Pardon me? Depends on who you're working with. Well, that's why I asked that up front about who's in front of you. But who's using, how many use a digital? One good thing I've kind of used, which is slightly different, but when I'm showing people like websites and stuff, um, someone else told me this tip. When you have like the iPad or something, put the screen down. So then that way they know that that's not focused now, that it's between you two. And then when you're bringing it up, you flip it back up and you go this kind of thing. Yeah, that's a nice way of making yeah. the, the distinction. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is to go through this whole overview of your services. I'm encouraging you to keep it corralled to about 18, 20 minutes for this part. We know you want to talk about CMA and pricing, but as far as for uh, showcasing your services, maybe about 20 minutes, give or take, depending on how many questions they have, and I'll just keep bringing it back online. Just to paint a little thumbnail sketch of each one and go through the whole process and wrap it up. About 18, 20 minutes. I'm saying that because I had somebody in Calgary um, years ago where at coffee break he came up and heard the advice. He goes, hey, it, 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 like a peacock, his chest was sticking out. He's so proud. He goes, I have a two hour listing presentation. And I said, uh, You make a lot of money? He goes, Oh, that doesn't matter. He says, I have a two hour listing presentation. He was so proud of it. And no, no, don't turn it into the never ending story, Gone with the Wind, part two. I mean, people would be sitting there nodding politely, but their eyes rolling their head going brain dead and bored out of their mind. Now, you just want to keep it short and sweet to the point. Now, let's just give a flavor of what we're talking about here. You see, even though newspaper ads are a dying medium, you see a two o'clock position newspaper ads? Is there a local newspaper that you still tend to use at all? Okay, fine. Are any of you of the autonomy, you can slap little spot ads in in a newspaper, or do you just totally ignore that and just focus on social media? So would you rather leave the newspaper ad off? Okay, the reason I'm asking, 
is that talk about adapting to audiences when i teach down in forest hill uh, chapel estates rosedale moore park to this day they still advertise say in the globe mail these little box advertisements because the affluent uh, consumers even the younger ones were weaned on those newspapers and admittedly now as a professional they just read it on their tablet but they still have that as an audience so i'll just give you an example of the language for newspapers and then we'll move on you show the example of the newspaper this is where you bring out uh, visual aids and you can actually have a laminated copy of the globe and mail and you're saying yes of course once you give us a go ahead mr and mrs sell we'll be advertising in, in the paper we get a lot of calls from buyers from here but where i take it a step further is once I'm working for you, I review the advertising in our market area on a daily basis. And if I see any other real estate brand advertising a property similar to ours, I'm going to contact that agent, send our information of our property, because the logic is if that agent gets a call off of a buyer inquiring about their bungalow, that agent doesn't want to just show the one property that night to the buyer, they want to show two or three. So why shouldn't our bungalow be one of the two or three they show that evening as well? This way we can effectively piggyback on all of the advertising in our market area. Do you see how that's an effective strategy? So you, it's just painting a picture. I see some of you nodding. And I'm not saying it's rocket science, but if any of you are even after years in real estate going, well, oh, that's different. What do you think the average consumer? You're saying, not only do we advertise, but I'm gonna watch for any other advertising, including on MLS. And if I see that once we have our semi detached on the market, if I see that there's been another semi up for a week, uh, two streets over, we leave no stone unturned, can't presume that, that agent's gonna spot our brand new property. So I flag them, send them the virtual tour, promote how attractive the property is, because if they've had any inquiries off of their bungalow, of course they want to then take those buyers through ours. See how that's a great cross-selling strategy? So that's, that's the rationale. You're just painting a little thumbnail sketch. So, what about the just listed cards? You all still do just listed cards, I would hope. They all, they know they should, but a lot don't. Oh. Right, everybody? Everybody knows you should be. Suddenly nobody's looking Doug in the eye. Okay. <laughs> Is it because you don't feel that they have any merit? Uh, I mean, think about it. How would you best use, just to share with your cohorts, what's an effective strategy with just listed cards? Uh, any thoughts? Personally, I think it's just sold. <clears throat> I do just sold. And that's you looking for more business? More business and cool results for me. This is proven results. For you? For me. Yeah. And what do we do up front with all this hot air about being so great at our quality service? What can we do during the marketing of the property that will actually help our clients, heaven forbid? That's all online. That's all Digital, online. online advertising. Yeah. Let me give you an example. We always pre-assume that when you list, say, 34 Elm Street, and you put it out there, and you broker load it, and it's on the internet, I like the way we pre-assume that the perfect buyer, the most motivated buyer who's willing to pay the most money for that property is currently looking. There have been many situations, I'll give you an example, I live in Leaside in or on Bayview Edmonton in Toronto. So we enter Leaside, lovely community, beautiful area, very mature, nice aesthetics. And the desired, the most desirable street in Leaside is Vestboro. Vestboro is a wider street, big estate homes. Anybody living lease, I would give them a nod and say, yeah, Bestboro is the street. Well, say you list number 13 or 16 Bestboro, and you put it out there and it's on realtor.ca and all the bells and whistles sign the front line, you know, you're having open houses. Well, what if hypothetically over on Randolph, you've got a lovely couple who have lived in this area for the last six and a half years, love Leaside, want to live here forever. Kids are going to be in school for years. They've always drooled at the mouth of saying, isn't Bestboro the best thing in the world? Well, they might not be currently looking. They're not currently on Realtor.ca. What if they don't happen to drive down that side street during this market for that week? Take your just listed pamphlets, and if this is a big two-story <coughs> estate property, take it upon yourself to knock on all the adjoining doors of all the smaller residences anywhere in that pocket, which is this, because you might be like a sleeper agent. You might knock on the door and say, just want to flag you where uh, number 34 uh, uh, Bestboro's just came up on the market but either you or somebody might be interested, and they might say, you're kidding, that's my wife's favorite house. Oh, we've always liked that house. And lo and behold, that is the buyer willing to pay the most money, but they weren't currently looking. Have you ever had a situation like that? <clears throat> I do list, just list the postcards, but um, I'm just wondering, is it more effective to door knock 100 doors 
for that, or is it better to have a distributing company do 500? Okay, just quickly, because we've only got the two hours, but when in doubt, it's obviously better, even in this day and age, just for uh, brevity, you can just uh, allocate or delegate it where it's just blasted out for hundreds and hundreds of pamphlets. But here's what happens that, let's say in this case, you get 34 Elm listed. If on the Wednesday night they list it, and then you're going to have your first open house on the weekend, and Thursday morning, I assume, they hand in the paperwork and it's broker loaded and the sign pops up on the, on the front lawn by Thursday early evening, thereabouts, give or take. Right. Depends on when it's or Friday, evening. whatever. Yeah. So in a short order, the sign pops up. Your first order of business for, as a marketing specialist is that as soon as you walk out Wednesday night, you go home, you're bouncing off the walls, you're all jazzed and excited, you can't sleep because you've just got a fresh piece of inventory. Soon your den office at home, just print off and just list it. Or even better yet, invitations, uh, a VIP invitation to invite the neighbors on the street to a private viewing uh, before your first public open house. You know all about that one. So before the sign pops up on the front lawn, next day, beautiful day like today, before the sign pops on the lawn, you knock every door on Elm except the one you listed. Hi, yeah, you say Century 21 Infinity, we just wanna let you know we just listed, and you use the word list here, we just listed number 34L last night, sign's not even up yet, just going around to invite you the neighbors who are having a private VIP social invitation this Sunday from 12 to one, let you come out and take a look. Then you lean forward and almost in a conspiratorial whisper, you say, we'd like to give the neighbors first crack where you get a chance to pick your next neighbor. So by leaning forward, see, we'd like to give the neighbors first crack where you get to pick your next neighbor. They say, oh, juicy piece of gossip, didn't know the sign, sign's not even up yet. And by hearing a juicy piece of gossip that they perceive as beneficial, it takes a sting of you knocking at the door. Now please don't dawdle with your time management. Get it listed, broker loaded, the sign pops up, and then you knock on the doors two days later saying, yeah, I just want to let you know 34 of Mayborn. They say, well, I know, schmuck, the sign's been up for a week. <laughs> so make sure that the, the very first is do the street itself, then at leisure you can do the other adjoining streets if you're trying to promote. Now, I just alluded to inviting the neighbors to a private VIP viewing. Are most of you employing that strategy? Are you all familiar with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The more upscale the neighborhood, the better it works. The more upscale the area, higher education per household, higher income per household, those are the consumers with a, a chip on their shoulder worrying about being stigmatized as a nosy neighbor. So, you know, we'd like you to come out and take a look. Great word of mouth exposure. Okay. Now, what about, uh, see the target marketing down at the bottom, six o'clock, that ties into target marketing those adjoining streets. What about the social media, internet, seven o'clock? Or even tied into relocation services with one of the biggest brand names that there is. If I'm that consumer, how do you showcase or describe to me say if you have an extensive relocation network within Century 21 as a global entity, you must have a pretty good story to tell. Can some brave soul give me just the gist of what you might say? If you have anything pre-memorized? I promise I won't criticize it. <laughs> Do you all understand the question? Relocation is like you see it from a military in that? Is that what you're Not so much military, but um, any corporate relocation. Um, say, for example, Century 21. Disgusting. Nationwide or throughout North America, as an example, if not the world, but say uh, nationwide, uh, you have an extensive um, uh, relocation network where people being, you see, you can even expand on it. You can say, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we have four types of buyers for residential real estate. We have first time buyers. We have uh, people either upsizing or downsizing. We put them in the same category. We have corporate relocation executives transferring to a different city. We have investors. And they're all predisposed to look on social media, on the internet, uh, doing a lot of research. And they're all motivated to a degree, but the most motivated under a time frame are corporate relocation clients where they have to move from one city to another in a very timely fashion. And we at Century 21, we get more than our fair share of those types of buyers because of our extensive network. And of course, if they're looking for our, our style and price of our property, uh, our agents would give preference to that and show it, giving us more qualified showings. And usually a corporate location executive can buy firm, clean, no conditions, because their company is helping facilitate the process. Do you see how it's, our brand is the best one to have in your corner for global marketing purposes? Mm -hmm. Colonel Don't worry, you got it on video if you want to watch this again and again, okay? <laughs> but you'll notice by now what I'm doing 
just for the sake of this exercise, is that if we're going through 14 different services and I'm painting 14 different benefit pictures, just for this illustration, I'm doing a bunch of tie downs after each one. But please, cautionary note, you would not do a tie down after every single one, because if you're doing a tie down, getting to agree after every single benefit, even the most unsophisticated seller would pipe up about 10 minutes in and say, hey, what are you trying to do, program it? I'm not Pavlov's dog, stop doing that. So what I'm saying over 20 minutes, if you've got 14 services and 14 benefit pictures, just have a spine of the occasional tie down, say four or five, along the spine of your presentation, because the whole thing is, if we have a nice rapport, and you seem suitably impressed with my professionalism, and I'm showcasing my services and painting benefit pictures that would pack your pocket, which is exactly what you want, and then once in a while I'm saying, do you see how that's an effective strategy? And if she likes what she's hearing, you'd probably nod back and, and mirror my, my body language. Say, yeah, that, that seems good. And then later say, do you see where you get more qualified showings by covering this avenue? Yeah, that seems good. So after 18, 20 minutes of you getting into the comfortable conditioning of nodding and agreement, when I go for the close at the end of 20 minutes, hard for you to recant and backpedal and say, well, no. That's the rationale. It would seem counterintuitive, counterinstinctive to nod in agreement of your own volition, no gun to your head, say, yeah, that sounds good. Oh yeah, I see the benefits of that. Yeah, that seems like it's pretty good too. I know it sounds mechanical to some of you, and I'm overstating it to reach that back row, so please don't over do the physicality and look like one of those toy dogs in the back window of a car with your head bobbing around. <laughs> okay, it's just, you know, just nod slightly. And if they like, people like what they're hearing, they'll nod back. So, sound like a good idea? Now you're resisting. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with the fortune? Okay. okay, now, database, eight o'clock. You have how many reps with the office here? 38, 37. Okay. You have sales meetings? Monthly. Pardon me? Monthly. Monthly. So you have monthly sales meetings. Now, if you are ever timing for it, being that you're on a listing appointment and they seem to be impressed with your services and you're showcasing all of these uh, benefits, and then it gets to the point where they're almost tempted to take action, you're saying, you can allude to the database. You say one of the key advantages is the market share we enjoy at Century 21 Infinity. If you're happy with my services, tell you what, I've got a great idea. We're having a big meeting tomorrow morning. If you give me the go ahead tonight to complete the paperwork, I can announce the property at our meeting to our collective sales force for our collective database with all the agents that have buyers for this category just as we go to MLS. It's a great way for us to springboard off into the professional market. Just give me the go ahead and I can announce it at the big meeting. Now you know it's the same schleppy meeting you have every month. You're saying we're having a big meeting tomorrow, right? Sorry, Doug. No. We're having a big meeting. Yeah, we're having a big meeting. <laughs> now you're not allowed to refer to it as a schleppy meeting from here on in, okay? So, council regarding house saleability, five o'clock. What about staging? Staging is so popular. Just share with me. I, everywhere I go, it tends to fall into two camps. But what about staging? Are you uh, Pardon me? Doing the consultation, just the consultation. You'll arrange for the initial consultation. Yeah. Do you hint or infer or imply that you're going to pay for that consultation? That is the service I offer. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't it hear It is a service I offer. The service I offer. Yes. Meanwhile, the consultant does it for free because they're looking for the business. No, we don't. No, they, don't. they charge you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just for a consult, they'll charge for a consult. Yeah. <laughs> 150 yeah. bucks. Okay. Now, yeah, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> no, what I'm saying is that when I say the two camps, what I was getting at, shh, what I was getting at is that uh, mainly you say to the, uh, the decision makers, uh, fine, uh, with your permission then, uh, giving me the go ahead, complete the paperwork, and the first order of business, I'm going to arrange for the expert consultant to come in, and she'll be able to advise you options about the different packages, and if you're interested, you can avail yourself of one of those packages, hinting or implying that they have to pay for it. Or what I see in some areas where the realtors are making $38,000, $40,000 a pop on the commission, they still don't want to take it on the chin so much or take a risk, but they'll say to the sellers, okay, you've seen my services. Um, if you give me the go ahead tonight to complete the paperwork, first order of business, I'm going to arrange for our top stage and consult to come in. I'll arrange for the initial interview. And if you avail yourself of one of their packages, which is your choice, help showcase the property, Here's the following arrangement. You pay for that package, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, and once the property sells and the transaction closes, I promise you, I'll put it in writing, I'll rebate you the entire cost of the staging. Does that sound fair? Because if they know they're gonna make 37 grand on the commission, and they have to pay out five grand for the staging, all predicated on a successful sale. 
they don't mind taking on the chin and tax write off anyway. So they make it clear, they make it crystal clear, they really punch that part saying, I will arrange for the initial consultation. If you, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, decide to avail yourself of one of those packages, the way this works is that you would go ahead and pay for the initial package staging. It'll help showcase the property. And after the property sells, we have a transaction and the transaction closes. I will be glad to rebate and reimburse you for the cost of all the stage. Now the nice thing about that is if they subscribe to that and you get a little agreement, making it clear that it has to be that a sale takes place, then that seller, that client, will stay fiercely loyal to you the whole way through just to get their money back. There's no question about being betrayed and going with a different realtor. They want the $4,500 back, so they'll stay loyal to you to the bitter end. Okay. Now, you see where it says color feature sheets at nine o'clock? We're all so caught up on the technology, which I understand is profound. It's staggering what's happened with the, the internet, social media, all the rest of it. I'll give you an example. This is a real life example. There's a top realtor in the Kingsway in Toronto. She has a team. But to this day, as far as I know, I haven't checked her in the last few months, but recently, she still was approaching this way. The top agent would be on the listing appointment, and she has a team, and she says to the decision makers, <clears throat> yeah, once you give us the go ahead, we'll have our videographer and the photographer come through and take all the pictures and the videos to showcase the property, like these other properties I've had the pleasure of representing. She holds up a few other examples of dazzling properties. And prior to the open house for agents on MLS, I will have it where my team, we network with all the other brokerages in the area. We have a good working relationship with the top 25 agents in this market region. We will personally target market all 25 top agents we have this networking relationship with. We show them the pictures, the virtual tour of your property and how lovely it is. We showcase your property to them. Because all of these top agents, they're the ones with the best buyers. We can't pre-assume they're gonna spot it on MLS, so we actually target them, take a grassroots approach, deliver a hard copy, and then send them the email with the, the virtual tour and the pictures. It's a great one-two campaign. And this way it flags how lovely your property is. It makes all the difference in the world to getting the top agents in front out to our property for showings and vanquishing the other properties vying for their interest. Do you see how this is a great grassroots campaign of getting maximum exposure? So she's, she's literally telling a bedtime story to a child where it's almost as if a seven-year-old could just sit there, close her eyes and say, give me the go ahead, sign the document take pictures and video, personally deliver hard copies to each of the top agents, network and chat with them, showcase and flag them to the pictures. So it's a nice way of, uh, like a little thumbnail sketch of describing the service. And she makes a million bucks a year. And that's one of her little hooks that she has right within the fabric of her presentation. Can you picture somebody doing that? Actually take, going to the five different companies in the area, knowing the names of the six top realtors in each office, putting it in their mail slot, and then in tandem emailing them the information with the, the link to where they get to look at the pictures. And yet, do you all take the pictures and send it directly to the top agents in your market region? And they, I, I mean, I email. I email? Do you email who? I have it. Oh, you have it? No. Oh, you don't have it? Building. On this oh, you idea. would? Okay. Building on this idea. I'm not putting anybody on the spot, but are any of you leaving no stone unturned and actually target marketing the top agents in your area and saying, hey, because well, they're busy, they're up to here with a, uh, everything on their agenda, when in doubt, spell it out and just say, by the way, or you see, if you get a brand new backsplit and it shows to perfection, and then it's a bit of a quieter market, and you see over four streets over, some top agent, you don't even like them as an individual, but they're with another brand and they've got a tired old backsplit that's been on the market for 27 days with no sold sticker on it, but they've had a lot of inquiries off of uh, the marketing of it. Do you do not with your perfect back split that shows perfection, flag them to it and say, by the way, just got this one last night, show it to your pickiest buyer, shows the perfection, because all the nibbles they got off of that lends itself. You can't assume that they're gonna connect the dots. You have to lead them to the water. Sounds too much like work? I think we all take for granted that we just assume everybody's on MLS every day and going through everything. So the old I mean, adage... It's a valid point. It's a valid it's point. So the old adage is, once you get to go ahead, you dump it on MLS and open phrase, someone's going to show up. I've been to realtors that I've 
spoken to in the past, like over other deals or whatever. And um, so then I just send them my listing. Right. And I once got a really nasty email back saying that I was spamming every realtor on my list because that they're all on MLS and by sending an email with my attachment was um, spam. No. <laughs> they probably want you to stop doing it because they can see it's too darn effective. So just ignore their flawed logic. I did, ignoring. I did ignore it. Okay. I'm wondering if you, if you like get criticized that. on things like this, it usually means you're doing something right. Okay, it's easy to try to tear people down compared to rising the occasion yourself. Now, you see where um, we talked about networking with the other agents. What about uh, it's funny with the sign on the lawn? Duh. Okay, we all have a sign on the lawn. How do you, before we met this morning, how would you paint a thumbnail sketch? of a benefit picture about the sign on the front lawn. Maybe use a little trial close while describing it. Any thoughts? Yeah. People identify the neighborhood they want to live in first and then they'll drive around looking for signs. Yeah, human nature, people, uh, buyers drive up and down the streets. Mm -hmm. First thing they spot would be a sign. Yeah. And if they see and call off the sign, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, it proves two things to us. First of all, it proves the buyer likes the area or they wouldn't call on that sign. Secondly, it proves the buyer likes the exterior of the property or they wouldn't have called inside. That means this buyer's already two thirds sold on the property. They just have to like the interior. Too good of a buyer to miss, wouldn't you agree? I thought over by the end of the driveway by the oak tree, that's a good spot, a high profile for the sign. People can see it from about a block away. What do you think, right next to the oak tree, is that a good spot for the sign? No, no, never mind about blocking anything. I'm just sharing as an illustration. You go through the whole thing, let me recap it. If we have a call from a buyer on the side of the front lawn, it proves two things to us. First of all, it proves the buyer likes the area or they're not gonna call. Secondly, even more important, it proves the buyer likes the exterior of the property or they wouldn't have called. They like the aesthetic exterior. That means this buyer's already two thirds sold on the property. They just have to like the interior. Pause, let it sink in. That's too good of a buyer to miss, wouldn't you agree? Then the little tie down trial closes. Based on that logic, I thought, the sign right by the fire hydrant at the end of the driveway, great visibility from about a block down the road for buyers spotting it. What do you think, is that a good spot right by the fire hydrant? And if they look at you and they say, yeah, that'd be a good spot. That means you've got the listing, ladies and gentlemen. You painted a benefit picture and floated the little trial closed question saying, what do you think of this little simple issue? And if they say, yes, put the sign there, that means they've made the decision to give you the go ahead and they're starting to give you instructions. And once they start to give you instructions, that's the beginning of the fabric of agency. And once they give you the yes on that, you can continue with the assumptive close that you've got the listing unless instructed otherwise. Now, if you say, what about by the fire hydrant? What do you think, is that a good spot? And they say to you, well, it might be a good spot, but we still have to talk about this, but at least it was worth a shot. Mm -hmm. And you keep going. It's known as a little trial close. By them saying, agreeing to the little non-threatening question, it precludes that they've made the big decision. Just like card sales. You know, they know you like the car and say, so which color do you want it, red or blue? Well, I want it red. Is that, that, 